From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis Codename Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. And by the way, folks, if you live in the fair metropolis of Los Angeles, we got to say we like it here. Three-fourths of us are on the road, but the strange news continues. Uh, we've got what uh, what you call it, Nola, heavy sandwich today. Uh, we've got stories of uh, like a lot of news broke right as we were recording last week, right after we recorded. The um, tragic cancer diagnosis of Kate Middleton came out. Uh, we also learned about a very suspicious Moscow attack, also heartbreaking, which we're going to dive into. We've got a fun superstition story from Japan. Before we do any of that, there's something we've been talking about off air that occurred quite recently in Maryland. Yes. And actually, I just got an update as we began rolling here. So we will work that into the story. But let's begin with What occurred in the early hours of Tuesday, March 26th? And we will give you some of this information from an NPR article titled, What We Know and Don't Know About Baltimore's Key Bridge Collapse. So in those early morning hours of Tuesday, March 26th, 2024, it's yesterday as we record this episode, uh, a ship called the Dolly, this is uh, D-A-L-I, it's a nearly 1,000 foot container ship. It's registered in Singapore. It departed from the Seagirt Marine Terminal in Baltimore, Maryland, traveled a very short distance, and then at around 1.30 a.m. Eastern Time, it appeared to lose power, at least according to some of the video footage that was captured of this incident. Uh, Then it shifted course towards one of the key areas of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which goes across the river there, right near Baltimore, Maryland. And it was traveling about 9.2 miles per hour, and it impacted the bridge. When it hit the bridge, the entirety of the bridge collapsed. It's a tragic, otherworldly, film-like thing to behold. It doesn't seem real. It looks like something that happened years ago and you would watch it on, you know, uh, some kind of documentary or something. It just, again, it doesn't appear real, but it actually happened. Thankfully, there was a mayday signal that was sent out by the crew of that large container ship, the Dolly. So police, they literally had 90 seconds to shut down traffic flowing onto the bridge from either side, which they were able to do. So uh, there were very few, if any, vehicles actually traveling across the bridge when it collapsed. But there was a crew of at least eight people, possibly more, working on that bridge repairing potholes when it collapsed. And as we are recording this, there is right now recovery efforts for those people. Two of them were recovered, one seriously injured, one uh injured but not as badly as the first person Mm -hmm. and there are six or seven people presumed dead who are still currently missing just because of the time that elapsed right exactly and the temperatures of the water and a lot of again the the drop from where that bridge. bridge was yeah exactly right now federal investigators are trying to figure out what the heck happened uh how did the power go out on this huge ship right after leaving port When it did go out, why did it go in that trajectory, like directly towards one of these huge columns? That is a fairly small target when you look at the length of the river there, right? Sounds like the rudder got frozen when they lost power. Exactly. And they were able to recover power, at least according to uh, some of the theories that are being the postulations, let's say, Mm -hmm. uh, that they were able to recover some power, but not to the engines. So they weren't able to get thrust or uh, they didn't have the ability to move that rudder to then change the ship's uh, trajectory or to slow it down. Do we have a sense of who's responsible or who is going to be held responsible for this? It's tough at this point. 
Yeah, right now it's trying to figure out what the heck happened, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is it the fuel? Is it dirty fuel? That's one of the theories that's come out that somehow messed with the engines so they were unable to perform properly. Was it someone at the helm that did something improperly? But either way, it seems like a tragic accident. At least it seems that way now. Although you will find people online talking about how it appears deliberate because there is, it does, again, it feels like there's something off the way. If you watch the full video, guys, I linked to a YouTube video that shows the entire, like several minutes prior to the crash and collapse. And it does feel weird. It feels like it goes on target to this pillar, even though that doesn't seem like what actually occurred. Right. Yeah. We were talking about this a uh, bit off air. Um, and I was, I was also talking um, with a bunch of folks on Twitter or X or whatever, some of whom like live and work in the Baltimore area. And it's the thing again, where we want to make sense of a tragedy, right? We want to have an explanation, ideally with a very clear good or bad side, right? But mm-hmm. from from what people are saying, from the analysis that I've read, I, I haven't traveled to this bridge, um, the analysis I've read and from what people on the ground have been saying, I haven't spoken with anybody who was actually on the ship, but they're they're saying it looks like the power loss occurred while the rudder was in one direction, and then um, the captain or the crew gave the order to try to drop anchor to swing a little bit um, more astutely right because or to prevent that curving toward the pillar and it's simply you know as we as we said off air it's uh really hard to turn those suckers they're absolute yeah. beast and even if a bridge looks big it's not built to withstand an impact like that and i'm sorry guys is, this isn't one of those bridges that can like open up to make way for large taller ships is it no it has the section has a in clearance. The se- kind of in mm. the center of it that has clearance for these larger container ships i see but it was built at a time when container ships were much smaller than this. True, true. Uh, it has, what was it, guys? Oh, man, I'm going to have to find it in one of my other links here. But it has the capacity to carry like 10,000 of these uh, container. What do we call these things? Cargo containers. <laughs> Cargo containers. It has a way, it's, again, it's 1,000 feet long. Mm-hmm. And it's way larger, way bigger. And, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the height. It could have made it just fine underneath that bridge if it had gone in the right place, uh, like mm-hmm. gone underneath the right place. It can carry um, almost 10,000 of those cargo containers. So yeah. if you've ever seen a, a train going by, uh, each one of those cargo containers, imagine 10,000 of those on a ship that's large enough to keep itself afloat and maneuver in the ocean. So these things are, uh, these things are very difficult to turn. It's possible to turn them on a dime, you know? Well, yeah. And again, they lost power multiple times in a very short time span. Uh, I think it was a couple of minutes where they lost power, recovered it through a generator, then lost power again. Mm -hmm. Um, The voyage data recorder has been recovered, at least according to the national transportation safety board. So we will be getting, I guess, a better idea or they will be getting a better idea of what exactly occurred, like minute minute by minute, second by second actions that were taken on the ship itself. There's been a lot said about previous safety issues with the ship. According to NPR, it's had 27 previous inspections. And in 2016, it's the this is a quote, it sustained significant damage to its hull after hitting a dock while leaving a port in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, And then last year, it was found to have a problem with, quote, propulsion and auxiliary machinery. But again, who knows? Is is this like a Boeing quality control issue that might be even company wide with these types of shit? I just wonder. I haven't seen that. Yeah, Dolly's made by Maersk and Maersk is um, they're a Danish company. They they make a ton of these things. Oh, a ton. Um, But they like any company of their size. They've had issues, but not at the frequency, you know, like the contained frequency of Boeing. And also, honestly, cargo ships function under such tremendous wear and tear and stress that it would be kind of surprising for an inspection to occur and not find a couple of problems, right? Because there's just so much stuff that could go wrong. Yeah, for sure. Really quickly, Alexis, I don't know if you're recording audio or if you're available for comment, but just since this is like the Baltimore area... I, and I wonder if you've had any 
If you've ever hung out over there in the Baltimore area at all, or you guys, have you spent much time over there? I just want to learn more about the Patapsco, or Patapsco, I think is how you would say it, the river that mm-hmm. uh, that this bridge was spanning across. And uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever driven across it or been in that area much. Just wonder if any of you guys, or if, if Alexis has. I've been there before, but I don't have any noteworthy um, affiliation with the area. Okay, <laughs> okay, it- cool. Everything I know about it, I learned from, I think, season two of The, the Wire, Wire. Mm-hmm. where it's all about the shipping, you know, yeah. and the, the what's it, what are they called, longshoremen and the union and all that stuff. And they talk about the Patapsco a lot in that yeah. season. And there's definitely a lot of, you know, there, there's it's about basically like, you know, um, planned oversight, let's just say, in shipping and receiving that I could imagine could trickle down to safety measures mm, uh, yeah. in terms of getting things through, maybe that should pr- pr- probably be given a little more attention just for the sake of keeping things running, you know? Yeah. And just to jump in on that, I have been to um, I have been to Baltimore. I've spent some time in Maryland. But Matt, if you drove over this bridge, you would absolutely remember it because it's so long. It's like more than a mile long. What, that freaks me out. Yeah, I would one point six or something frankly. miles. Yeah. And uh, and then also, if you're not familiar with the area in general, and I think a lot of us uh, probably aren't. Uh, the Baltimore shipping, the magnitude of that industry cannot be overstated. This is a huge blow, and I'm sure we've all seen the photos in the aftermath of the literal waiting line of shipping containers that formed within just, I mean, fewer than 24 hours after this. Well, yeah, so let's talk about that. The the port where this ship left is further in towards Baltimore, right? So if you imagine coming in from the sea through then the river, then to get to the port, the uh, bridge was standing between entrance to that area and the port, right? So effectively right now, there is just a bunch of metal shrapnel and shards of a giant bridge that is all the way across. So it is preventing ships from going in and out of port right now, at least for the most part. And the story really shifted quickly from tragedy to an economic, a story about economic impact because $80 billion worth of cargo goes through this port every year including, according to NPR, 850,000 cars and trucks. So imagine that, first of all. Uh, That's like shipping, manufacturing vehicles. Um, It also provides 15,000 jobs uh, to human beings that work there in the port and about $3.3 billion in personal income to families, right, to people who actually work there, and $2.6 billion in business revenue, And lastly, $400 million in tax revenue, according to the state of Maryland. The president went on television and discussed this, like, we're going to get this up and running again. We're going to get the port going. We're going to clean this up. We're going to rebuild the bridge. And he also stated that the federal government would be paying for the rebuilding process. That answer is part of the who's responsible. It's not who's responsible per se, but this is something that's larger than just uh, one company making a mistake or, you know, uh, the the city itself having to take charge of, of the, the reconstruction. This is like practically like a state of emergency situation, right? Like a yeah. act of God, right? Yeah, for, certainly. It, it's a massive tragedy for the eight to 10 people, possibly more who were affected or, you know, injured or killed by this event. Uh, there were 20 people who were on the cargo ship. All of them have been accounted for. It is still a mild unknown about the number of human beings that were actually on the bridge when it collapsed. Um, So that's something we're going to continue following. Um, And if we hear anything more, we'll definitely we'll talk about it. Just the last couple things to point out here. If you want to watch the full seven minutes, 20 seconds of before the crash and the crash, I would highly recommend you search for Francis Scott Key Bridge Collapses in Baltimore on the first coast news youtube channel you can find it right now and watch the whole thing it's a camera from down below like uh if you imagine a the perspective of another boat maybe sitting on the water and watching everything happen it's very very intense and also if you want to keep up with just news that's breaking with regards to the story there's an ap news feed that has been updated that we've been following uh basically since this began 
you just search for AP News Baltimore Bridge Collapse, and it'll give you a live feed. of like at Every time something new comes in, it just pops up on that page. It's very, very helpful. Anything else, guys? I will say, you know, that we take allegations of bad faith actors pretty seriously and looking into this at this point, knowing that there's still a lot of information out there at this point, there does not seem to be any plausible support for some of the um, speculation or some of the more out there conspiracies that are floating around, like the floating around poor choice of words, but like a false flag attack or, um, you know, the investigation has to keep going. So we have to be careful, uh, even if a story sounds really juicy and you're hearing it on the internet, we have to be careful to dig in and prove things before we, we make those kind of claims. I mean, chances are, like as case in point with the Kate Middleton stuff, if those things are coming out really quickly after an event like this, probably mm-hmm. some of these professional speculators just doing what they do on the internet. Well, yeah, again, it feels not real right so as you said ben we we look for any kind of explanation that would satisfy whatever that thing is that makes it so extraordinary or feel so extraordinary to us um but yeah we'll just keep an eye on it as we hope you will too let us know if you find anything we'll be right back with more strange news and we returned with a decidedly lighter story um, after that one about the bridge collapse. Um, and again, our hearts are with anyone who's missing loved ones, with the families, and uh, it's just a really horrible situation. Uh, but let's take a little trip over to Japan, uh, where they they love. There's a lot of American cultural crossovers. Obviously, we import a lot of Japanese culture over here, anime and, and manga and tons of video games and technology and all of that stuff is huge fascination in the United States with Japanese culture that does go both ways for some things. Two of those things are baseball and Kentucky fried chicken. Um, And a ways back in the earliest days of another show that Ben and I do together called ridiculous history. We did an episode on what's called the curse of the Colonel in Japan, especially uh, Ben, correct me if I'm getting this wrong around the holidays, around Christmas time, KFC, is hugely popular. They sell these like family holiday mm-hmm. dinner combo things they're that you have great, to like reserve. Way. I'm sure they're great. They're and, great. And I know, and, and from my understanding too, KFC over there operates at a little bit of a higher level <laughs> than it does over here. Oh, and it's kind sure. of considered plussed up fast food and more of like a family restaurant. Kind yeah. Of, right. Yeah. Pretty much every, and, and this is, Oddly enough, this is a rule of thumb that apply a rule of wing or drum that applies to uh, that applies to a lot of fast food places in different countries. Like McDonald's is the fancy place in a lot of countries, and KFC is, to your point, uh, it can be culturally fascinating to see what a big deal it is. It became tied with Christmas. The you can go to. Um, you can go to any kind of website, uh, Mental Floss, Atlas Obscure, probably has some great write-ups on it, and read the read the meal. Like the big thing is the Christmas cake that they get. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's what sets it like apart that over here. Um, I don't even know they do pot pies anymore. <laughs> anyway, though, these meals are so popular, Ben. To your point, these holiday combo things that you have to reserve yours well in advance yes. and they they sell out of them and then anyway but so kfc and baseball uh baseball you wouldn't think there'd necessarily be a connection between kfc and baseball but a baseball team in uh, the nippon uh, professional baseball franchise and nippon just means japan i, I believe if, yeah. if i'm not mistaken um that has been active since 1935 uh known as the uh, hanshin tigers have sort of a little bit of, of lore uh, that's tied up with um with colonel sanders himself who is in fact a real person Harlan David Sanders. And I think he himself actually appeared in the earliest of KFC ads when it was, you know, fully Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, Since his passing in 1980, he's been personified in different ways by actors and and animation and what have you. Um, But yeah, much like Orville Redenbacher, this was in fact the founder of the company and the secret of of the spices or whatever the blend is that that, that they keep so guarded. Uh, Apparently when he was still alive, there was a beef between, or a chicken, shall we say, between him and the uh, the new managers of the company where they changed the recipe and he got infuriated by it. And then they had to like kind of make night nice, and then they, they didn't have to, but 
he they made nice with him and changed it back and then kind of brought him back in the fold. And then he did pass away in 1980. Um, but we know him by his kind of like the branding of KFC. And that extends even over here. It used to to these like plastic statues that would be outside of KFC franchises. But the Hunch and Tigers uh, from 1936 to 1949 were very successful in their league and they won four titles in that time frame. They reached the what's called the Japan Series, which is, I guess, is akin to our World Series. For the very first time in 1962, uh, they won the Central League in 1964, but then lost one more of these Japan Series. Uh, it wasn't until 1985 that they won another Central League pennant, and it was such a big deal that fans of this franchise, uh, who are kind of known to be a little on the fanatical side, all dove into the Dotambori Canal in Osaka, which is is a highly polluted and very deep canal that sort of splits up the city, the downtown kind of part of the city. I'm maybe think of like the Seine in France mm. a little bit, or, or sort of like the, uh, you know, the Thames, um, mm. but it's a little, it's narrower, uh, obviously. Not as dirty as the Ganges, but still Not you don't as dirty, wanna, but you, you don't want to drink the water highly filthy uh even back then and now it's even worse apparently it's been described as you know something akin to to sewer water um but like, that didn't stop these tigers fans when they won the pennant they jumped in uh and a uh at the same time a particularly uh, zealous fan uh spotted a uh, one of these colonel sanders statues outside of the local kentucky fried chicken franchise and they thought that it looked a lot like the first baseman Randy uh, Bass, was, right? That's right, yeah. Randy Bass. So he uprooted it, ripped it up out of its perch or whatever, and threw it in the river, which is pretty deep, or the canal. It was sucked down into the mud and the muck and lost, uh, presumably forever, until 2009. Uh, but anyway, when this happened, though, uh, it is believed by you know those who believe uh, that this uh, started a curse on the Hanshin Tigers, mm -hmm. and they didn't win a, a single thing. It's like uh, angels in the outfield type vibes uh, for 18 years. Oh, uh, one quick interjection, though, to def in the defense of the guy who throws the statue in or the crew yeah. who did it. It wasn't everybody, all the fans jumping in. They were yelling out the individual names of players. That's and they right. were looking around the crowd to see who most looked, looked like, like that it, player. Uh -huh. And they were like, jump in the river or you'll get jumped into it. Uh, and then Randy Bass, you know, this is Japan. They're looking around and there's not a lot of people that you would see it immediately think Randy Bass. So that's why they grabbed the statue. 100%. And I'd totally forgotten that detail, Ben. And I think that really kind of gives a sense of uh, the energy that was going around. Um, so it wasn't for 18 years that the Tigers won another Central League title, at which point fans did dive into the Dutton Canal once again, uh, sadly ending with a man losing his life. Because this is, again, I don't, I'm not sure exactly whether he drowned. There was probably some drinking involved or whether it was sepsis or something. But uh, that's neither here nor there. He did uh, lose his life. Um, but then fast forward. 2009 when the city was doing some dredging of the canal and they recovered the original statue which is a little rough looking all the paint worn off and quite worse for wear and missing a hand um but they did they did get it and they uh believed that this at least was the very beginnings of lifting the curse of the colonel because that year the tigers finished fourth which is better than they had done um, in 2014, KFC moved the statue to their Japanese corporate headquarters, and the Tigers made it to the Japan Series, but they did unfortunately lose to the uh, Fukuoka SoftBank Hawks. Um, but the news today, the update to this story, which we did cover on Ridiculous History, is that uh, the Hanshin Tigers just won the 2023 uh, championship. Um, for the first time in, in many, many years, leading some to believe that the curse has now officially been lifted. After they won, fans did jump into the river, the disgustingly polluted river, once again. Uh, but here's the part that I think is really neat. Um, the statue, which has since been moved from the corporate headquarters to another franchise, it has been officially retired and is essentially being treated like a sacred religious relic, uh, whether it be a you know publicity stunt or, or I don't know what you want to call it, um, but it was essentially exercised uh, in a ceremony at a, a nearby shrine 
in a, uh, a cleansing ritual um, that is usually, it, I, did, I, don't, I need to look into this a little bit more. Maybe Ben, you know this from the time you spent over there, but in a ceremony that's usually reserved for dolls, because I know that they, there certainly is a lot of belief in Japanese culture of objects being able to, to hold evil spirits and, and things like that. So maybe, I don't know, why would there be a specific ceremony just for dolls they felt was just appropriate enough to do on the old Colonel st- sculpture? Yeah, I mean, it goes back into the um, into some really deep folklore. You know, the idea that an object can be imbued with the spirit or sentience, especially if uh, in some cases there's this idea that even just your furniture at your house, if you take care of it and it gets to the age of 100, then it, it acquires a spirit. Uh, so the idea also goes into the concept of respect, right? So part of the curse of the uh, of the colonel comes from the idea of public disorder and breaking you know breaking the expected rules of society so cleansing this is also a um, a sort of apology to uh to offending the character of the of the spirit the shrine or the effigy Makes sense. And, and, and just really quickly, credit where credit is due. This actually comes from a, uh, a sports reporter um, named Julian Rial, who is a, a Brit uh, living in Japan. He lived in Japan for about the last 25 years, and he's sort of a lifestyle and culture writer and uh, has a really neat article uh, called uh, Curse of the Colonel Lifted, Japan's Hanjin Tigers Hope Ritual Ceremony Bats Away Years of Bad Luck. And just last last thing for me, this ritual was performed at Sumi Yoshi Taisha Shrine, uh, and a priest did this cleansing ritual, and the a president of KFC Holdings Japan, uh, Takayuki Hanji, was there, and he laid flowers on an altar and made. I'm sorry if I'm laughing. I, I know this is a you know offering food to descendants of the thing, but this is screams publicity stunt. Uh, he offered a portion of KFC chicken as well, um, and did you know. Uh, call it what it was. You got to at least appreciate the openness. Uh, was it an original recipe or extra crispy? Do we un- know? Unclear. I don't even know if you can get the two, uh, if there's a distinction anymore. Um, but he did say that he he was very aware that this whole saga, this whole like lore has contributed to the raising of the value of their brand name. So I don't know, guys, <laughs> any thoughts on this? It's just it's such a neat, weird story to begin with. And uh it's the idea, you know, baseball is in general such a superstitious sport in America, even where people are, you know, won't change their socks or have certain pregame things or, you know, rituals or chewing the same piece of gum or whatever. Um, it's really interesting to see these kind of cultural uh, things sort of collide in a very interesting amalgam of American and Japanese culture in this story. I don't have too much, guys. I was just having fond memories as you were discussing it, Noel, uh, seeing Norm, Norm McDonald as the colonel. Like mm-hmm. back in the day and Daryl Hammond and a bunch of other actors got to like do cameos and I was just having fond memories of that. And I hope this, uh, I hope the team does well. I miss this. Do we know where the uh, statue will ultimately find its resting place? Yeah. I'm sorry, but I didn't get to that. The, the, the whole um, thrust of the ceremony is that it ends in, in the burial, the ceremonial burial of this sculpture. Uh, I, I can only assume it is on site at the shrine that I mentioned, the uh, yeah. Sumiyoshi Taishi Shrine. Out in Osaka, um, right? Yeah, in Osaka. So, uh, you know, it certainly would also be another great branding play to have its final resting site marked so people can go leave KFC buckets and, and flowers, yeah. you know. I'm looking at photos. I've been to this shrine. It is dope. It is amazing cool. if you can go. Uh, but the colonel wasn't there. When I when I saw no it. no no this is pretty new yeah I I also predict uh, on the note of superstition and folklore that there will be a new uh, relic of power or an object of power as they're called in control in the nation of Japan the search continues for the left hand of the colonel right and the glasses I forgot I neglected glasses, to mention that his glasses right, had also right, right. been knocked off or, or whatever which is weird because I don't I don't ever think of the glasses as being a separate part of a of a sculpture I wouldn't think so know? either but maybe, maybe it was like it's plastic so maybe it was sort of you know hot mm. glued on or something kind of where weird. is the left hand man I'm gonna be thinking about that you know like the old uh, hand of glory in sure. uh, in infernal magic I, yeah. I would I would love to <sighs> 
The she hand is remains. Where someone finds the hand of the colonel and the cur- there's a curse or it has power. What, what, I'm just going to write it. Let's what was the, no, what was that movie with the hand? The recent movie, Speak to Me? Talk yeah. to me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was maybe a great they find one. the hand yeah. and it's, it's, it's imbued oh, with some sort of that mystical, was an excellent, yeah, uh, uh, infernal uh, powers. I really like that movie a lot as well, guys. Uh, another great example of like you know, kind of like the Daniels, uh, how they started, kind of do it as like real lo-fi, practical kind of music video things. Like, I can't remember the dudes' names, but it's a brothers, the twins. I think the Philippou brothers is their name. They they have a, a YouTube presence of like really crazy, cool YouTube kind of videos that are like artsy and, and bizarre, and they are now making giant movies that did well so good for them but yeah that's it for the curse of the colonel hopefully it's lifted uh let's take a quick break and then we'll return with one more piece of strange news and we have returned uh, <laughs> a couple things uh in our conversation just to respond to the conversation about the baltimore bridge i think we should do an episode on the shipping the cargo manufacturer that created that because i'm looking into the conspiracies they've been tangled up with in the past and there are quite a few so that's just like a a note to the universe. I think yeah. there's an episode there. Great. Awesome. And I wanted to start out by, uh, I'm not going to put you too much on the spot, Doc, but I want to thank you on air for making my day uh, earlier today and sending me a joke that we will never, never mention on the <laughs> on the show. You remember what we're talking about? I audibly gasped when I, <laughs> <laughs> when I heard it the first time. Okay, never, maybe we won't. Never mind. <laughs> Anyway, uh, just to tell you that even in our case, there is some stuff, uh, <laughs> there are some jokes we don't want you to know. There's some stuff but, no one should know. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, yeah, but that was a that was some real gallows humor there, Doc. Respect and salute. Uh, our final story for this week's Strange News program is, uh, like the Baltimore Bridge, it is an ongoing story, and the a tragic mystery is afoot on March 22nd. Again, as we were recording previously, a small band of terrorists attacked a music venue in Moscow. And as of now, at this moment, there are an estimated 140 deaths with north of 360 injuries, either as a result of the gunshot, as poisoning of the um, the fire that happened shortly thereafter. There were four terrorists involved, uh, and pretty soon after the news broke, IS, the Islamic State, claimed responsibility. The Putin administration continues uh, to claim that this was actually... Uh, this was actually an operation by Ukraine or uh, some agent of the West through a proxy. And they're claiming, I, I mean, they're all but explicitly saying they believe they believe that uh, the West and or Ukraine managed to use IS, the Islamic State, as kind of a, a false flag, right? Or a patsy to blame this on. So... So if we go to the timeline here, what we see is that the the Crocus City Hall, that's the music venue, it's in a place called Krasnogorsk, uh, and I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, it started right before a Russian band called Picnic was scheduled to play a sold-out show. And this is a very, very big venue. Uh, we know that it just it gets stranger and stranger the deeper you dig okay at first we know the basic timeline these masked gunmen in combat fatigues came in they opened fire on the crowd using ak style assault rifles uh they also apparently had pistols and knives and put yourself in this situation if you've been to a concert uh that has a lot of theatrical sound design then you might hear gunshots and think it's part of the opener you know what i mean like travis scott or whatever right um and and also want to stop there uh do you guys are you familiar with the russian band picnic i was not picnic yeah no no okay well they're they're pretty big because this is a this is a huge venue um unfortunately at the time also 
there were children and teenagers in this venue for an unrelated ballroom dance competition. So that gives us a sense of the size, the fact that they can have these two big events going on at once. Um, And there is a little bit of video footage that shows these people firing into the crowd. It appears they're wearing baseball caps. Uh, The assailants are apparently uh, heard shouting to each other in Arabic, and then they escape after deploying incendiary devices, we should mention, uh, gas bombs to start a fire in the auditorium, which led to even more injuries. Um, The authorities responded as quickly as they could, but the gunmen initially escaped, and then they got captured per Russian authorities uh, attempting to exit Russia via the porous western border uh, in the war with Ukraine. Does that jibe with what you guys have seen in reporting? Yeah, it's just been really complicated to follow because there have been several high-level conspiracy theories that have been put, put out by the Kremlin, um, which are fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, just about, again, often placing blame on the West, uh, like instead of ISIS or ISIS as the cover. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's really changed a lot since this story first broke again. Like last time we were recording one of these strange news, it happened like right after that. Yeah, um, It's just confusing. It feels it feels weird and a very high level tragic attack on civilians. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was talking with, um, I was talking with some people familiar with this situation doing like just a vibe check, you know, what, what can you tell us about this? And even if you are just looking through uh, a cursory kind of like forensic Google investigation of the context and how the situation came to be, then you see a lot of troubling things. It is a fact that the West warned Russia that some attack was imminent. Uh, They were, it was um, Canada and the United Kingdom and the U.S. warned any of their citizens in Russia. There seemed like there was an attack. The U.S. privately warned Russian officials that this spinoff, this franchise of the Islamic State was going to attack because they had gathered intelligence uh, earlier in March, like earlier that month. This was fresh baked information. And uh, Putin apparently roundly ignored it because the U.S. intelligence community officially, they have something called the duty to warn requirement, which means that if there is a, a dangerous like attack on civilians that is imminent and actionable, then it doesn't matter if you're friends with the country where it's going to happen. You are supposed to let them know because the innocents involved, you know, they have nothing to do with the larger wars. So Putin and uh, Putin's circle, or I guess I should say the Putin administration, they dismissed this and they didn't just say it was incorrect. They said it was blackmail. They said it was a threat. So they're saying they didn't take this as a, hey, let's at least work together to save lives. They took it as, I I guess, a very sinister move, right? And that may be part of why Putin is accusing Ukraine, which he did immediately. And Zelensky uh, came out from Ukraine immediately and said, no, absolutely not. We did not do this. Uh, And... (laughs) Let's think about the people, the countries that were warning Russia, Canada, the UK, the US. This feels five eyes to me, right? Uh, because for the US, I don't know, the conspiracy theories being floated by Russia, tell me what you think about this one, is uh, that you'll see people on the internet going, you know, it's interesting how ISIS seems to be attacking enemies of the West now. And the concept being, the implication being that the Islamic State itself is heavily compromised. And maybe now the terrorist has become a puppet of Western forces. I think that's a lot. That seems kind of complicated, right? Well, overly so. <laughs> to the point where it seems, you know, it's, it's that thing where whenever a conspiracy has way, way too many moving parts or mm. way too many parties that need to be in perfect sync and cooperation, chances are... <laughs> The reality is something a little more streamlined. It's a little Rube Goldberg-esque, right? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, but it is a 
an organization that has largely fallen out of popular coverage in, in media, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I don't know when, when you feel like there's an armed somewhat organized group like that, I'm not saying there's any sand to the accusations that it's being used as some kind of puppet organization, but it does feel weird when you don't hear about it very often. Then something this high profile comes along, right? That appears to have a lot of planning, a lot of strategy to get all of those people, you know, into where they were to have the weapons they had and to pull it all off. Yeah. Um, it feels even more organized than you imagine a, a group like that would be. Yeah. And also not just to the point of organization, but if you look at the fingerprints of previous IS activity, this doesn't match their MO. This is a change. You know, they usually, without sounding too crass, uh, they usually send folks on a one-way trip when they're sowing this kind of tragedy and chaos. And maybe it's because this is a, um, this is a regional branch or a subsidiary of the larger Islamic State. This is ISKP, uh, Islamic State Khorasan Province. But the idea that they would make an attack and it not be a suicide attack, that is it is just markedly different. You know, um, previous Islamic state things like uh, we had discussed a little bit off air, um, the attack in Iran, which led to more than 100 people dead, that was two in that was two suicide bombers. So it seems strange, or at least, uh, you know, I don't know how much we read into it, but it is worth noting that their tactics have changed at this point. They attempted to have an exit plan. And then also, why would their exit plan be Ukraine? I, is it because the border is more porous due to conflict, but then knowing you would have to drive through bloody swaths of the military, the military that you just attacked or his country you just attacked? It's, I don't like it. It's dodgy. It's suspect. And uh, there's another there are even more pieces that get stranger and stranger. You guys remember the apartments, right? How Putin came to power? Mm -mm. Oh, man, it's not a story the Jedi will tell you. Uh, okay. In, <laughs> can, can, we, can you tell us here? <laughs> yeah, sure. In awesome. 1999, there was a series of explosions for apartment blocks in uh, different cities around Russia. Moscow, Bunyaksk. Volgodonsk, uh, more than 300 people were killed, thousands of people were injured, and this became one of the events that led Putin to his current level of power. Because after those bombings occurred, Putin used it as the pretext to launch a second war in Chechnya, and this became a long, protracted war uh, it wasn't just a special military operation. History is proving that is apparently never the case. And for a long time, Putin's critics uh, and Putin's rivals and journalists, they maintained that Vladimir Putin may have pulled like a PNAC or even something more, even something more evil that he either planned the attacks or allowed the attacks to happen so that he could gather power, consolidate power, and launch this war in Chechnya. Uh, this also led to the Yeltsin losing power and stepping down in 1999. So if you believe that there is more to the story than the official narrative right now of what's happening with the Moscow attacks, then you look at prior events like this. And I've got to tell you, I don't know the answers uh, in this specific regard, but surely just with the things we've outlined in less than 15 minutes here, it's suspect, right? It's fishy. Does this not seem fishy? Oh yeah. Highly. I just, the question is like, what, <laughs> who, why, mm -hmm. when, where, and how? Yeah. What kind of fish, what kind of fish is it? It's unfortunately a good question. We're, we're going to have to we're going to have to think about it, and we need your help, folks. So let us know uh, what you think of the official narrative. Obviously, the Putin administration is going to use this as further rationalization for the conflict in Ukraine. Um, we still don't know how much force Russia can put, like how much extra force or additional force they can put into play. 
And a uh, quick last note, uh, Putin did quite recently, like as we're recording, come out and say that he blamed radical Islamic extremists, but he said that he believes they were operating at the behest of Ukraine. But we'll leave you with this. Those terrorists, those four guys killed, uh, killed well over 100 people and then got back in a car, drove almost 2,000 miles past multiple military checkpoints before they were caught. The Islamic State doesn't do stuff like that, or they didn't. Makes you think. It just goes back to the, what, trained by the West, basically. ISIS did it, but they were trained. That's the claim that's being made there. I mean, right. it does sound like tactics that you'd, you'd hear about with special forces training or something. But again, that's complete speculation. We don't, we don't have the proof. You know, We just yeah. know that there are, there are things that complicate or uh, that call into question this official narrative we're getting. And we now have two competing narratives from the uh, superpowers of old, right? We warned you. No, you threatened us. And now we will respond. And when elephants make war, it's the grass that suffers. We want to hear your thoughts, fellow conspiracy realists. Tell us what is on your mind. What is going on in Moscow? Would love to hear uh, from you if you're in the Baltimore area or if you're in the Moscow area as well. Uh, And we're wishing your friends, families, and yourself uh, safe travels and adventures and good health. Uh, We hope that you do not get cursed by a fast food mascot. That's a good way to end it. Uh, and yeah, let us know your thoughts. We try to be easy to find online. Or even like a cereal mascot, like that Toucan Sam or, or, or Lucky the Leprechaun, man. They'll, they'll come for you. Be careful. You can find us. Let us know what your favorite uh, fast food or, or, or cereal mascot is. You can find us at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, where we have delightful videos rolling out every week. I think we've got another uh, installment of the George Washington saga as he travels through time and discovers products of the modern day that plunge him into existential dread. Uh, You can find us also at that handle on X, FKA Twitter, on Instagram and TikTok, where at Conspiracy Stuff Show. We also have a phone number, one eight three three stdwytk When you call in, you've got three minutes. Give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your message on the air. If you don't want to do that, you got more to send us, maybe, I don't know, links, attachments. Why not send us a good old-fashioned email? We are. The folks who read every single email we get, be careful. The Void may write back. Send us the links. Put it on record, put it in writing, send us the pictures, send us the audio. It's one of our favorite parts of the show, reading your emails. So help us out. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.